Welcome everyone to today's discussion. We're very excited to have everyone here today. Today is going to be a panel discussion about the film Having It All, and it's sponsored by One Million for Work Flexibility and Flex Jobs. Uh, I'm going to go over just some housekeeping notes before we get started. Again, I, my name is Bree Reynolds, and I'm the director of online content at Flex Jobs. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, the film is available to view tonight until midnight Eastern time, so if you didn't have a chance to um, see the film before today's discussion, please feel free to go back and you can view the film. Uh, you can go to flexjobs.com to get details for that. It's right on our homepage. You just click the button to register there. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so please feel free to um, send that recording along to family and friends and share it on social media and just get the word out about uh, this really important film. And also, um, be sure to tell friends if you want to watch the film tonight or you think other people should, um, let them know that they can watch the film as well by going to flexjobs.com. And then we're using the hashtag having it all film. So if anyone's interested in sharing this information on Twitter or even just you know, sharing your thoughts about the film, um, please feel free to use that hashtag. The, the discussion today is going to be a panel discussion and then we're gonna open it up to audience questions. So um, I'll introduce the panelists in just another minute here. We do have some handouts that you can download. Uh, the handouts are available right now on your GoToWebinar control panel. So if you look on your screen, if you don't see your GoToWebinar control panel, look around for a little orange arrow. And if you click that arrow, it's gonna open the control panel up. And you'll see a handout section where you can download uh, two of the handouts that we have available um, with information on the, all the people that we're gonna be speaking to today, follow-up information, and, and all that good stuff. And so you can download those now, and then you'll also receive an email tomorrow with a very quick survey about the event. We'd love to know about your experience, how you felt, and, uh, and also in that email, there will be the handouts to today's event, so you can download them from the email as well. So let's get into our guest panel. Um, I'm gonna uh, just uh, let everyone know who's here today, and then we'll get right into the discussion. Uh, first, we have Kelly Wallace. She's a digital correspondent and editor at large on family, career, and life for CNN. Welcome, Kelly. Great to be here. And we have Jennifer Owens. She's the editorial director of Working Mother Media and the founding director of Working Mother Research Institute. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. And of course, we have Vlada Knowlton. She's the director of Having It All and a filmmaker. And we are very excited to have you here today. Thanks, Vlada. Hi, thank you. So excited to be here. And we have Sarah sutton Fell. She is the founder and CEO of FlexJobs and One Million for Work Flexibility. Sarah, thank you for being here. Thanks. So happy to be here. All right, great. Well, let's get right into it. First, Vlada, I wanted to ask, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I totally forgot. Before we get into the discussion, we do have an audience poll that we wanted to kind of find out a little bit about everyone who's attending here today. So we're going to run a poll through GoToWebinar. Um, you can find that popping up on your screen and you'll be able to uh, uh, answer the questions. Um, we'd like to know if you're a working parent, a stay-at-home parent, if you have no kids, or you're an empty nester, just to kind of figure out where everyone in our audience is right now here today. So I'll give people a few seconds to vote here. It looks about we have halfway, uh, half, about 60% of the people have voted and it's speeding right up there. So it looks like we have about 58% are working parents currently, about 15% are stay-at-home parents, about 10% are empty nesters, and about 17% don't have kids right now. So that's great, very good to know. So it looks like the majority of people are working parents, and uh, then we have a sort of a tie between no kids and stay-at-home parents, and then uh, empty nesters. So very interesting, good to see, it's a, a good mix, but. Um, as might be expected with this topic today, um, working parents are, are the majority of the people attending. Cool. Thank you all very much for, uh, for taking our poll. So, Vlada, I wanted to get straight to you and just ask, um, you've done a few screenings of the movie in Seattle. What's the response that you're getting from people, um, from men and women, about what the movie's meant to them? And then also, how are the women in the film doing? Um, do you have any sort of updates for us? Yeah, so um, first of all, thank you for hosting us. Thanks, Flex Jobs and One Million for Work Flexibility. I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks to everyone who's tuning in for, for your support and your interest and for watching the film. Um, yeah, so we've had um, 
several screenings um, in the Seattle area, throughout Washington, really, um, as well as um, Oregon. Um, anyway, so the the reactions have been um, pretty amazing, um, and some very surprising. I think what I'm what I'm seeing overall is that everyone is able to relate to the characters in the film in one way or another. Uh, the film, even though it has sort of one overarching thread, it, it, it um, talks about a lot of various issues that um, touch many different people in different situations. Um, and so I'm actually amazed by how many different types of people are affected and moved by this film. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of responses that, and I'm really happy about this, that are essentially saying, um, you know, I, I went through something like this, I had such a tough time, but I thought I was alone. I didn't know that other people were experiencing something like this. And it's, you know, it's so great to see these women up on the big screen speaking so honestly and candidly about this topic. And, it, you know, a lot of people have been telling me that it really made them feel better, that it made them feel less isolated in this, in this kind of tough experience. Um, as for the women in the film, I'm happy to say they're all doing really well. Um, they're all in good places in their life now. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with them now. Um, they've been very supportive. And, you know, as you saw, <laughs> excuse me, in the end of the film, um, Jessica and Kate remarried. Um, they're, they're doing really well. And I think they, they all learned so much from this experience that, you know, they took all of the things that they learned, all the things that opened their eyes to the reality of, of their life. And they managed to really shape their lives now into you know, their own unique uh, ways of, of having it all, their own unique, you know, happy places, uh, ways that they can manage to incorporate all the things in their life that they really, really must have. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, they're just doing great. Oh, that's so good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah, and I, I'm one of the many people, as you mentioned, people who are identifying with this and and really feel like, you know, you sort of feel like the only one as you're going through it. And then to see a film like this, it really shows just how common these experiences are for people. And um, and very glad to hear that they're all doing really well. Um, and that's a really good segue to kind of our first topic question here. Uh, so, Kelly, I'd love to throw this one to you to answer first. But um, what do you identify most with in watching this film, having it all? Was there a particular moment in the movie that you really related to or that just stood out to you? Um, yeah, what really stands out for you? Yeah, well, first, wow, Vlada, I just want to congratulate you. Uh, you know, I watched the film today, and I was blown away by it, um, certainly by the ending. Um, I, as I said, I didn't expect uh, what happened in, in two, of the rela two of the three relationships. But I think what you said, Vlada, really uh, stuck with me, too, which is that uh, you really can relate to these characters, and I found myself relating to each of them, right? I, I so related to Trina when she's in tears, you know, uh, at the daycare center, and I just remember, I remember those same moments of, um, you know, how am I going to leave my child? I can't even leave my daughter when I first had her for a haircut, let alone, right, go to work for 10 hours a day. How am I going to do it? And I remember when I went back to work um, and I went, started a new job, and my first week of work, they told me I had to fly. I was working at CBS News at the time. They told me I had to fly to Boston for a story. And it was going to be on the CBS Evening News, and it was really exciting. And I just hung up the phone, and I was in tears. And my husband was trying to tell me, but you're going to be on the CBS Evening News, Kelly. I'm like, but I'm not going to see my baby tonight or tomorrow night. Like, it just completely uh, floored me. And I found myself, though, also relating to Jessica as she really sort of was thinking about her career and her husband's career and how having a child would, you know, when's the quote right time? I mean, I sort of remember myself thinking about that, although I, I ultimately sort of, you know, put that away once I decided we wanted to have children and figured, you know, I, I actually figured that once I had a child, I was going to like continue my hard charging correspondent life and be traveling all the time and everything was just going to be perfectly easy and fine, you know, and that 
of course, is not the case. And then I also related to Kate, especially when she talked about where's the time for your relationship? You know, that once you have your child and you're juggling your work and your careers and the child, and it's like where do you find time for each other and how important that is in terms of keeping the relationship going. So I just, I just felt like you could relate, I could relate to each of these three women in different ways. Yeah, so true, so true. And Jennifer, did you have sort of the same experience? Was there anything in particular that stood out to you? Well, I think Kelly pretty covered it there. So I, I think I, I had very much the same uh, responses to each of them. Yep. Yeah, it's really, it's universal. There was something for, for every, in all of those stories for everyone. Um, and Sarah, what about you? What really stood out to you in watching the film? Um, yeah, I... I, similar resonated in so many different ways. I think that, um, you know, as I was speaking with Vlada a bit before this, uh, before we started, you know, saying I had first worked with Vlada on, on I'd first seen this movie almost almost a year ago when we first started talking about doing this event, and um, having watched it again today, uh, I had very different reactions actually because I the first time I watched it, I, I anticipated. I kind of was thinking it was going to be something inspiring in a way, to be honest, that you, that it can be done and, and kind of a happier ending um, and realizing that that's not, in, in fact, after thinking about it, it's actually not the norm. I mean, it's, it is. This is a very difficult topic. There's a long way to go on it. Um, and watching it today, I'm at a very different point in my own personal life in that I am separated from my husband now, which is different than when I watched it the first time. So some of the, the very realistic parts of this I thought were very powerful um, and it also reminded me as as Kelly said each of the women's stories uh, struck me in in different ways and I, I I mean it's the topic of the movie and so many essentially but I love how they all had different perspectives on their careers um, you know, Jessica was waiting almost. She was putting parenthood off until tenure, and her career was that was kind of part of the strategy. And then Kate um, was really strategic in how she was networking and keeping a presence, even while she kind of off ramp to be a mom. And her uh, and her um, husband was uh, with with her child. Um, and then Trina really had been a career woman from day one, never really worried so much about parent being a parent, and and then when but then dove in, um, and and how struggling, how much of a challenge that is. Uh, so I think that it resonated on all of those levels, and for me personally, when I, you know, for, well, when I started flex jobs, the reason I did that was because I was pregnant with my first son, and all my career I'd never really realized how the, being a woman would play. I'd heard that there were glass ceilings, or that you know, I'd heard about stories, but I really never realized how much it would really negatively or adversely impact my career or could potentially do so. And it wasn't until I was laid off in my last trimester and interviewing for jobs in my last trimester, <laughs> which <laughs> didn't go so well. Yeah, not so, <laughs> and not so easy to do, right? No, and it was the first time I realized that, you know, I'm highly qualified, highly, you know, have a lot to contribute to a company, but I wasn't going to get hired because I was pregnant. And it, it just that moment of where, We've come so far as women, but we have so much further to go still when it comes to parenting and, and this kind of having it all concept. Yep, it's so true. And that's actually sort of a perfect uh, segue to the next question, Sarah, so thank you. <laughs> um, Jennifer, <laughs> I'd love to start with you just about that concept of having it all and how that changes for each person throughout the course of their own experience. So for you, um, how has your own concept of having it all changed um, when it comes to work and career, you know, from before you had children to afterwards? Um, how has that changed? How do you kind of view it now? You know, I was thinking a lot about this, and I, I maybe I'm odd, I never thought I would have it all. I always, you know, I put myself through college. I... I graduated into a recession. I had to get a job at a newspaper in a dying industry because, of course, I had to do the hardest job that I could find. <laughs> and so it was, you know, as the splats of, of my industry fade in, in the chasm as I run across it in my career. Um, so it, I'm the worst person when they do that. Where do you see yourself in five years? So in that sense, there's never been an all. I, I've never, and I've, I've always been dubious about uh, people who think there is an all. So I guess, you know, I, I really, I chase at the whole phrase of having it all. I think 
life is a constant cycle of opportunity and obstacle, and so we're kind of always, you know, the, dealing with whatever's in front of us, I guess. So I, I think, but what changes with motherhood is that there's, it's way more complicated and there's uh, the the array of colors in front of you of which ones you're you're focusing on and what you're tactically trying to get to is now not just about you and maybe your relationship and your career but now there's a child and that gets way more complicated as they get older and more complicated with their lives and um, and there are pets now and the relationship becomes deeper and it's more difficult and they're more annoying in your life and um, so. <laughs> So I guess it, so for me there it I guess it's changed in that it's gotten more complex, which in some ways is wonderful and beautiful, in some ways is really much harder. But that I never thought there was a there was an end to there was an all there like on the on the game of life by Milton Bradley there was never an all for me. It was I just always like to put everybody in that little car as you drove across <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> my cousins always beat me at that game anyway, so I guess may maybe that's what beat the whole <laughs> all out of me. So um, so, so I guess just that it's gotten more complex if you're using the phrase having it all. That's, that's what's changed for me. Yeah, it's, it's so true. It's so interesting to think, you know, that, that people view this in so many different ways. And I know, Sarah, you were talking about that having it all concept and watching the movie and sort of originally hoping for that happy ending um, that we all love to expect at the end of a movie and then realizing that that isn't necessarily reality. Um, so has that, is, did that occur to you over a long time from having kids, you know, before with your career versus after once you've had kids? Did that change your concept of having it all? Um, absolutely. I think that <laughs> when I was thinking about really when I was younger, pre-kids, um, you know, the ability to control not only my own destiny in like the lofty kind of sense, um, but also my time, <laughs> just being able to control my time <laughs> was you know, and I could decide what to do with it. Um, I think that, that that was pretty core to what I believed in. in I, I had a, I was empowered to have it all in a way. Um, and I was able to be capable to accomplish what I set my mind to do. And I think that after having children, <laughs> um, that that's really become rare where you have control over your time or that you're your first priority in a way and, and being able to set out what you accomplish <clears throat> whether it be in the first year of motherhood when I mean I used to go from getting whatever 20 things on, on my to-do list done in a day to maybe two um, <laughs> that kind of that kind of reality where you're just it seems so surreal and it seems so hard and then it, it's very difficult to I think reconcile who you were before and who you were after um, and and now as you know I, I, my children are seven and nine you know I, I'm, and after watching the movie of course we have a sense of what the concept is of having it all you know having the, the thriving healthy well-loved children have the healthy relationship the successful career and all at the same time um, you know I think that it's you know, I, I'm sure I fall into that sometimes of wanting all of that too. Uh, there's a lot of societal pressures to have that, um, and it, it is. I think that I've I've learned that I I don't know if anyone's ever done a boogie board, like one of those little there's a little wheel in the middle and you kind of balance. And I know a lot of people hesitate on using the term work-life balance or balance in general, but the way I view it is more of an ebbing and flowing, uh, mm -hmm. whereas it's about sustainability, that you're never actually like balanced perfectly in the middle. You're always kind of ebbing and flowing, but you have to choose decisions that at least can be sustainable so that when you tip too far to one direction, you have to be able to catch yourself and go back the other. And, um, and that could be sometimes you're focused more on your career and sometimes you're focused more on your family. And, um, but whatever it is, in the big picture, it has to be you know, kind of somewhat sustainable. And so um, yeah, I think it's shifted a lot. I mean, the freedom I had pre-children um, is very much different uh, now and but have gained a lot too of course yeah yep, you know this absolutely. is oh this is Kelly I was just going to jump in if it's okay Brie because what Sarah said I mean I totally agree I remember a friend of mine told me years ago because I always sort of thought of like the balancing act and I think the concern you have with that is that you're always about to fall right you never 
straight up or you could you know once one move and you're off off the beam the balance beam and a friend described it in terms of sailing now I'm not a sailor but I still I still like her her description of life which is that you're on a sailboat and sometimes you have to tack more toward family but you're still on the sailboat and you're still going forward so you're leaning more toward your family and away from your professional work and, and demands but then other times in your life you might have to tack more toward your profession and then away from family but again you didn't tip over as you said Sarah you're still on the boat and you're moving forward and I love that and I think I unfortunately Jennifer I don't think I was as savvy as you by the way I I fell into the trap of thinking you know you could have it all I remember I was a correspondent at CNN I thought I'll have my baby and I'm gonna have my baby and that's gonna I'm gonna be great mother and I'm gonna be able to give you know 180 percent to my work and also to my relationship and that, you know, fall into the trap of what we see, I think, in the movies or in television. And well, that's because no. you have hair and makeup in TV. In New York, <laughs> we don't have any of that stuff. So, you know, I could there tell you go. Fall into that trap. That, that's you know, how. I right? suffering okay. board of zoning appeal story. There's no camera <laughs> there. So. Okay, so that, oh, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to see how it, it, it was explained. But I did quickly learn that and fall into, or not fall into, then become the, you can't have it all at once and I like to add those two last words because I do believe in the context of my life and I hope in the context of of every person's life that we can all have all of what we want and whatever that is you know in terms of reaching whatever personal goals professional goals you might have over the journey of a lifetime not all at once and so that I think is a, is a real trap for women and men uh, especially as we become you know parents and if we're balancing a career and a child and a family that that whole notion that you're supposed to have it all at one time uh, it's very damaging and we all we know uh, you know how negatively that can impact it has it, it impacts all of us but how it can impact everybody else as well yeah if, uh, that's such a good point if I can if I can jump sure in, yeah go ahead it's it's interesting uh, what you guys are saying. Um, it, it's really covering these two main um, sort of coping mechanisms that have been coming out of um, conversations I've had with people who have watched the film, which are, you know, people realize um, after a while, especially going through times of struggle in their life, that one, you know, realistic expectations are super important. It's a... Uh, you know, things are going to be tough no matter what, but um, trying to go into a situation with expectations that it's going to be difficult actually helps a lot, you know, to cope with this situation. It's, it's going to happen whether you like it or not, but um, knowing that it's going to be a tough time actually ends up helping people. Um, and also, you know, what I'm, what I'm hearing, and I think what I'm hearing you guys saying as well is that uh, for us, our generation of women, perhaps our last couple of generations of women, you know, one thing we've had a tough time doing is saying no to elements in our life that need our attention. So, you know, we have three or four different full-time jobs, and uh, they all need our attention at the same time. And it's really difficult for us to say, you know, just, just hold off for a second. I'm going to focus on this for a little while and just kind of prioritize from one moment to the other. Um, and I don't mean one moment to the other, but, you know, one month to the other, one year to the other. Um, and one thing that people, a lot of women especially, end up figuring out is that they need to, they need to uh, learn how to, you know, say, I guess shift their focus and say, you know, I'm going to hold off on focusing on this particular part of my life for just a little while because I really need to focus on this other thing and not feel guilty about it. If, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it really does. I think that is one of those obstacles that people run up against is even just themselves and trying to get, um, like you said, their expectations If you're going into this, if they have their expectations more towards, you know, you're not going to be able to have it all all at once, they might get through it a little bit easier than somebody who still has that expect expectation that everything is going to fall perfectly into place and and all of that. So um, as far as obstacles go, I would love to have each of you talk a little bit about the obstacles that you faced as working moms. Um, what are maybe the one or two biggest obstacles that you that you face um, 
when it comes to work-life balance or the concept of having it all, whatever that might mean for each one of us, however we view it, um, Jennifer, do you, do you, what sort of obstacles have you come across um, just as a working parent that you didn't necessarily have when you were not a parent? Uh, just the, the, um, the restrictions on your time. I mean, the minute that you are now dealing with uh, any sort of daycare, we use center-based daycare for our kids, that you need to become the super incredible efficient person. And you need to account for, at least, you know, in New York and I'm sure in other cities, is, is the commute time to get to that daycare. So because the minute you're thrown off from getting somewhere and you're late, either the clock starts ticking or you're going to face really grumpy uh, daycare providers who are mad that you're late for pickup. So I think that that is one of the things, I mean, I'm, I'm 12 years into being a working parent, so I've, I've gotten used to it, but that is a huge change that you can't just, uh, you know, I'll just stay and I'll just get it done. Or, and I no longer can be the, the perfect employee who can get mm -hmm. it all done early because I can, I can work. When, when I was in uh, daily newspapers, I would do uh, a feature in the morning, go uh, cover something in the morning, like at 10 o'clock. I'd stay all night to cover a night meeting, write a story, get home about midnight, and then I'd sleep in if I wanted. You know, my time was my own. And then I'd start the next day and do a story at 11. And then I just had a shifting set of hours. My life is so incredibly scheduled now. <laughs> um, and it's scheduled, like, because right now, like, I'm doing this from home because this is parent teacher conference day, and my son got off at 11.50, and he's back um, working on his homework, you know, like, it's just constantly the scheduling, which can get a little overwhelming after a while, where you kind of think, can I just take off for a Ruba? You know, maybe that's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> you know? that's nice. Yeah, it, it, Jennifer, it's pretty funny you say that I have, um, uh, it's parent teacher day yep. for conference days for me too, and I have a sick kiddo mm. at home. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Right. Um, it, yeah. It, it, it can all be a perfectly moving um, machine until pe one piece of sand sand gets in there and it it, it all falls apart. Um, and I yeah. just want to say on this topic, you know, we've done a lot of different surveys of of our, our Flex Jobs' audience on working parents to ask, you know, what are their biggest obstacles or what what are their stress points. Um, and most working parents, the, of the, the number one answer um, is, is juggling the children and wanting, that's mm -hmm. why they want flexible work because uh, it's just so difficult to have a rigid schedule as you were alluding to. Um, and then I think that it also plays into the, the, the taking care of yourself part. 93% um, of, of working parents in one of the recent surveys said that having a, a more flexible job would help them take better care of themselves. 64% said it would help them be a better friend, um, and 89% said it would help them be a better spouse or, or partner. Um, so these are things about not just taking care of, uh, you know, our lives and, and making it work, but it's also about taking care of ourselves. And I, I think that, that that's a really big obstacle when you're trying to, to squeeze every little thing you can out of every little second. And as, as moms, particularly, we're inclined to give up. You know, we are taking care of other people around us often, starting with our children, often our, our families as a whole, and a little maybe be if you're caretaking parents also, and, um, and working. And so we kind of get left out of the equation often. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. true. I think Trina had mentioned that in the documentary that um, she was really struggling with having to focus on when her baby was first born, not caring as much for herself and letting certain things go in that area. Lada, did you um, did you notice that um, from the women that you interviewed in the documentary, just of, in terms of obstacles and and that care um, for themselves is one of those areas that became tricky? And also from your own personal experience, um, what have you found obstacles wise? Uh, yeah, I definitely, definitely saw that as a, as a major obstacle when I was filming these women um, taking time to, to focus on themselves, take care of themselves. And as you said, especially Trina really articulated that so well. Um, and for me personally, of course, that was an issue. Um, one other major obstacle that I, I had initially and that um, I think a lot of people have is communication. So finding that sort of common language with my with my husband 
or, you know, for anyone with their partner, being able to communicate um, about this particular issue in an effective way, you know, in a productive way. So finding that common language where the two of you, if you're trying to share household management chores and so on, you know, where you both understand where the other one is coming from, what the importance of what you're talking about, um, that, that has taken us, you know, some time to get to a point, you know, for me and my husband, where we actually have that sort of um, effective communication with each other and understand this issue together. Um, initially, that's really hard, I think, when you first get married. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think, uh, especially Kate, uh, I, I was talking to her recently, she she learned a lot about um, the, the importance of communication from her experience. And I think now with, with her new husband, they've actually kind of worked out a really good communication method based on Kate's experience from before. So I think that was that was really important. Yeah, this is Kelly Yevlot. I thought you brought that out so beautifully in uh, in the film, and in particular at Kate's relationship, because remember there's that scene where she and her husband are talking about what's going to happen, and, you know, she says we're kind of, you know, treading water. I forget the exact words, and he sort of didn't, it's interesting, he didn't feel like they were, but she was sort of like, well, you know, we're going to have to see where we go. Like there's going to always be this sort of give and take, and, and that is so clearly. Right. Uh, they had very a, different perspectives. Yes, you could you could see that. Um, you know, I was going to say in the sense of for me, you know, the time component, just like you all mentioned. But for me, you know, I really faced it head on was the issue of flexibility. Uh, I was then uh, when I first had my first child, I was a news correspondent. And understandably, it's not, you know, it's 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 hard to have as much flexibility, I think, as you want, although I'm a big believer that I think you can add flexibility to any job, you know, anything, um, especially in our world where we're mobile and we can be, you know, writing and, and reporting from anywhere. Um, but I really kind of saw that very clearly when I was uh, at a job where I just was not going to be able to have the flexibility and autonomy that I needed to be, you know, the kind of mother I wanted to be. And that sort of led to a path of uh, ultimately uh, finding kind of a different path and one that in the digital space and focusing on women's issues and whatnot, it, it became uh, you know, I was finding it, and I remember when I was at iVillage, which was a, a women's website uh, for women and and working families as well, and unfortunately it's no longer uh, in existence now, but it was filled with working parents, filled, and it was just like a given that if you had to leave to pick up a sick child or you were home, uh, working from home because you had a sick child, no one questioned it. It was you're going to get your work done. In fact, so many of us would be emailing each other at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning because we couldn't get some work done in the middle of the day, maybe because we were taking care of a sick child, but we were then more than making up for it, you know, in the hours overnight. And so mm -hmm. that's why I just feel like, to me, that was a very big personal obstacle that I faced, and it's just such an important one as I continue in my career. But I still think that really no matter what the job, we can – we can have more flexibility um, just by the way we work, and that would be a huge, huge benefit uh, to every working parent. And now, Kelly, do you see yourself as having it all now? Like, you know, as as your view of like where your career is, like, is that a success or is that is it, have you somehow failed because it's not exactly what you thought you would be doing at 22? Yeah, a lot. You know, I think right. uh, I feel right. But I feel like it, it changes. I feel like total success. I mean, I do have people who will sort of say to me, "Oh, Kelly, uh, I bet you wish you were covering the White House right now." Right. And um, and I say, "No, actually, <laughs> I don't wish I were covering the White House right now. I really enjoyed covering the White House." Uh, all right, come on. The, the presidential campaign right now would be a hoot for so many reasons. Yeah, right. Obviously. Like, yeah, uh, right. yeah. But I don't. No, I don't feel that way. I mean, I just feel like I have been able to do. Um, you know many different things in my career and I don't you know I don't know where the future like it's the first time in my career I'm not so yeah. sure what's next and um, and but my full pie here is myself my you know career goals but also being the parent that I want to be and being around and being present and having that flexibility that means everything so I, I see that as 
a total success in my own journey of ultimately kind of going where I want to go. I don't I don't see it as other people might do it. I'm sure Jennifer, you know, I'm sure some people might right. do it as, oh, Kelly, um I don't see that at all. Um and in fact, many other people who are sort of, you know, sort of see it say, wow, you were able to transition and rebrand yourself and maybe even have more longevity in this career path if I stand this career right. path as opposed to if I were your, you know, news correspondent, uh, general assignment correspondent. So, um, but that gets to a, such a good point too. You have to, you have to figure it out for you. You have to try right. to get rid of that background noise and the judgment. And we all do stories on all the judgment that moms and dads and women and men put on each other. But you really, it's a really important point. Try to sort of tune that out and just be in your core of what you want and what is going to be important to you, um, that to me is the best way to get, get, get to that, you know, level of success that you're seeking. I agree. I, I completely agree. agree. I think that that's it. one of the things with um, the concept, even if you buy into the concept of all, you know, what else would you have agreed to when you were 22 that you would never have thought, you know, coming out of college, <laughs> you've never evolved your thinking on? So right. that's why there's no all, because it is continuously shifting. And so, if, you know, if someone's coming up to you at, you know, who's 25, and they do judge us on, well, you gave that up. You know, yes. You're looking at it all from a glass half empty perspective instead of, my glass yeah. is so freaking full now. Yeah. That it's, <laughs> it's overflowing, you know? <laughs> Exactly. So what, yeah, that's a great kind of segue. What would you say either to yourself, your 23-year-old self, or anybody who's, who's about to become a, a first-time parent or a first-time caregiver? I know we've actually had some comments from people who aren't parents, but they are caregivers and trying to do that balance as well, which is similar but also has its whole, you know, own set of, of different yeah. things to consider. But what advice would you give? I know... Um, I think it's a lot of, you mentioned, um, you know, having, talking about having a communication almost protocol with your spouse um, and, and really <laughs> working on that part of it. Um, what else would you, what other advice would you give to people who are just about to get into this uh, wacky world of, of parenthood or caregiving? Yeah, uh, that's a, a good question. Um, what would I say to people just entering this phase? What would I say to myself? early on. Um, I think the most important thing is to prepare yourself mentally for a very challenging time. Um, just be ready for anything. Be ready to work really hard. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Be ready to struggle. Um, but also just keep in mind and don't worry that whatever you want to accomplish, and, and I say this with full honesty, whatever you want to accomplish, whatever is important to you, um, you'll get there, you know, just um, at some point or another, you'll get there. Just uh, be ready to work hard, harder than you thought you ever would, and um, just be ready for it to be really difficult. Um, I think setting your expectations at that sort of realistic low level will help, but whatever it is that you hope to accomplish, you'll you'll get there at some point. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really wonderful. And I, actually, I think Kate said in the movie something that really struck me, which is that it, when, something she learned as she was going through all of this, that it's important to question the path was, that was laid for you, whether intentionally mm -hmm. or just kind of general expectations, and, um, and realize it's okay if it's not that, you know, that perfect path. Um, and so one of the things when I've talked to friends, younger friends who are having children, or, or maybe not younger, but just first-time parents, um, be easy on yourself. Mm -hmm. Be oh, easier yeah. on yourself oh, yeah. than you've ever been. <laughs> because, I, you know, I, again, it gets back to, like, you're not going to be able to accomplish what you thought you could accomplish in a day on a, on a very micro scale. But then you just really not beating yourself up because um, we're, you're learning on the job. It's the ultimate learn on the job job <laughs> um, oh, as definitely. a parent. Even if you've had young, I mean, I had a much, I had two much younger siblings, and I grew up taking care of them and babysitting, and I thought I was pretty well prepared. Uh, and really, even with close friends who are parents beforehand, I really, and having had experience, I was not pre that prepared. So I think asking for help is really important, um, and being easy on yourself, and, and trying to take care of yourself as best you can. And Diet Coke is your friend that first year. <laughs> it was all coffee and diet coke. <laughs> diet coke and coffee for sure. 
Exactly. Maybe a glass of wine sometimes, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. I, you know, <laughs> there were parents in that first year with both kids, because it's a year of darkness. You're just struggling through every day, and that's okay. Um, but, yeah, you kind of feel yourself, you're self-medicating. <laughs> you're, you're ramping your – you've got no sleep, so you're ramping yourself up with caffeine, <laughs> and then you're bringing yourself down with a glass of wine. It, it did take me a couple of years to get out of that cycle by the second kid. I'll, I'll admit to that. So, uh, you know, I'm off the caffeine now, but it's every yeah. day. My eldest is 12, so I'm a right, little late. But, yeah, it, it, right. <laughs> it, took, it, it took a long time. No, I mean, I totally can relate to all of this. And I remember in the film where Trina, you could see her where she said, oh, mm. I'm up every three hours. I, 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 I can't have a minute to myself. I mean, oh, it takes us all right back to those early days. Exactly. Um, Exactly. And I was remembering advice. Again, I was at CBS, and it was a, a CBS executive there then. She had a couple of kids. And she gave me this advice, which seemed so simple. And it seemed kind of cool at the time. Like, it, it didn't totally um, connect with me at the time. But much later, it did. And it was like, look, when you're at work, focus on work. And what she meant was, and then when you're at home, as much as you can, focus on home and not work. And what I guess she was sort of thinking is instead of me mm -hmm. sitting there at my desk at CBS wondering, oh, what's my daughter doing? And is she rolling right. around on the floor? If I had a good, you know, child care situation, we had daycare and a sitter, and you feel good and confident about that, then when I'm at work, just, just focus on work, try to be as efficient as I can, get my work done. And then when I'm home, if possible, um, and I can put yeah. the iPhone or BlackBerry away so that I can totally be present uh, at home, and we just have a colleague here, one of our senior producers for Anderson Cooper. Um, she just returned to work about a week or so ago after having her first child, and she said it is so hard. And I, you know, I said all the things that we've been talking about: be easy on yourself. You know, ultimately it will get better. But I did give her that advice because she was sort of thinking, oh, my sitter, you know, was sending me pictures all throughout the day. And I said, just try your hardest. Because it's just too hard emotionally, at least for me it was, to be sitting at my desk thinking, oh, what's my daughter doing? Or then when I had two girls, what are they doing? And, and I feel guilty for not being there. Instead, just focus on where I am and what I'm doing. And then when I'm home, give that my 100% attention. That I still do to this day, and it, I find it really helpful. Yeah, and I don't, I, I don't mind if, it, if we have time to add one quick thing on that. Um, you know, I wonder... I. I it's still, as I watched this movie and as I kind of went through parenthood, I, I'm still kind of shocked that I didn't know more of what was to coming. And <laughs> the first sign was actually, I feel like, like actually labor. <laughs> I think yeah. obviously millions of women go through labor, but nobody, like, until you actually do it, you really don't realize like, how. <laughs> yeah. um, and and yeah. I think we, we jokingly would say that, you know, maybe women historically didn't tell other people because they thought that they'd stop having kids, you know, <laughs> or, or something like that. And I wonder if it's like there's a way of getting almost, you know, as advice, try to find a met, like a, a mom mentor almost, or like somebody who can really talk to you about the the details, um, because it is, you know, this is not something that's talked about a whole lot, and maybe no. even as an employer, yeah, of I, people like ask, actually it, maybe having stimulating that kind of conversation in workplaces too. That if you know somebody, as you said. Um, that they just came back from maternity, or who just came back recently, pairing them up a little bit loosely with somebody else who, who's gone through it. That's oh, really happening that's a lot at the, uh, the Working Mother 100 Best Companies. We hear a lot of chatter among them. They really are, it, this past year saw a lot of attention to the idea of, of maternity coaching, they're calling it, you know, because mm -hmm. they have to codify it into a practice. And I think they're thinking about it. And then, and then I also think of all of us who have gone before. It really is. It's, 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 it's just, it's putting a hand out to, to these new moms that we see. And, and offering offering that advice, uh, Kelly, that advice is, is spot on. It's the only way. Try bringing your kid to work for a day. That's the worst. <laughs> that is not, you're not getting anything done. Oh, we know Nothing. that. You're not being a good parent, nor are you being a good employee. And right. Yet, y'all do it because we have to. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I love that idea, yes. though, of the maternity coaching. I think that is, um, mm -hmm. and that concept. And it, I remember doing a story. I can't remember the the full title of the book. It was it's by the author, um, the president of Barnard College, Deborah Spar, and it's all about this issue of perfection that so many women uh, we grow up thinking we must yeah. achieve, you know, from our body image to our academics to our work and to motherhood. And she was saying that part of it, she thinks, is that too many 
successful women, she thinks, are afraid to really tell it like it is, that if they really tell you how difficult it was or whatnot, I don't know, like that there's some image that sometimes that they feel that they have to uphold, quote, quote, we ha I have it all, right. I'm able to have it all, and that it's a sign of weakness. If you say, no, I had, you know, throw up on my arm at six while I'm trying to do a conference call. I mean, <laughs> um, I think we're getting better about it, certainly through, you know, certainly your work, Jennifer, and, uh, you know, all the, the writing that is done and, and film and television, pop culture. But I think we could do a better job in some way yeah, of communicating that so that people don't fall into that sense, that perfection that they have to achieve. My mother, the working mother, uh, said to me, well, if we told you the truth, you'd never do it. Yeah, that, that's probably, yeah. that's something, yeah. <laughs> well, good. This is actually, this is a good chance to jump into our Q&A. Um, and I know one of the final, final questions we were going to ask uh, was what strategies do all of you use um, to try to juggle? I think we already got to a bunch of those. Um, and I did want to share, we had a couple people from our audience who've offered their own strategies. So I would love to share those with the group just to, um, you know, get some kind of group sharing out there for what, how people can cope and, um, and excel when they get into these situations or at least get through them, <laughs> if nothing else. Um, and so uh, this was, uh, let's see here. Oh, sorry about that. Just a little pause in uh, technology. Um, one person was saying it's really important to choose um, a partner who you can communicate with. So that's really echoing the communication thing. Um, you know, the person that you're going through this with has to be someone that you can rely on. Um, and uh, uh, taking time for yourself, uh, make sure that you care for yourself, even if it's one minute of breathing by yourself. Uh, one woman is saying um, that that can really be helpful just going into like a spare closet if you can't find any other space to be alone by yourself for one whole minute of breathing. Um, that can be really helpful yeah, as well. Yeah, don't tell people. I hide out and get coffee by myself sometimes. I bring stuff I have to read. I, I just need 20 minutes yep. myself. <laughs> so everyone should do that. It's, you know, but don't tell because then they'll all come in. <laughs> then they're all going to find you to have <laughs> yeah. the brainstorm for the next issue. Yeah, exactly. Yep, we all have our secret places. Um, so, Vlada, this is a question for you. When you first decided on doing this documentary, did you have a particular thesis in mind? Did you sort of see perhaps where you thought this might go, or did you just kind of let it open up before you? Kind of, what was your process when you got into this? So when I first started, it was interesting because uh, what what prompted me to make this film, what gave me the, the initial idea, of course, was my own experience. I had gone through this sort of very difficult time a year or two before I started making the film. And my thinking at that time, and now listening to this conversation and looking back on it is a bit funny. I actually, when I went through it, I thought, well, I missed a lesson somewhere. You know, I, why did I not know? Why wasn't I prepared? And I, and I actually thought that making this film and um, watching these other women go through it would actually teach me something about how to cope during this time. I was interested in seeing how they would go about, um, you know, managing the first the first year essentially of their, you know, new baby's life or the first year of trying to have a baby with their spouse. Um, and so I initially thought this was going to be a film about the the challenge of working and having a you know your first baby, um, sort of what kinds of things different women do to kind of manage it all, but. The interesting thing is it turned into a, a large a larger thesis in the end where you know they they struggle just as much as I had struggled and I realized that I think every person you know every no matter <laughs> what your education level is every person goes through this kind of struggle and and in the end it's about not just the baby and, and the job it's about this sort of overall issue of having, you know, the relationship and the career and being a, a mother or a father and the household manager and having these full-time jobs at the same time, which in the end you kind of end up having to sacrifice one or the other or, or a couple of them for some brief period of time. Um, so it grew into a sort of that larger thesis in the end and um, it wasn't exactly what I expected when I first started. Very interesting, very interesting. 
Um, and for this is coming from Anne, a question from Anne. Um, for those uh, of us who choose to or chose to quit our jobs and stay home for a few years, getting back into the workforce can seem very daunting. Uh, mm -hmm. What tips or recommendations do you all have for people who are just trying to get back into the workforce, either part time or full time, after taking that time off? What are some of the the first, you know, baby steps? pun fully intended, um, if they should take after they're getting, <laughs> trying to get back into it. Um, I'm happy to answer yeah, 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 go I mean, Jennifer. I was going to say either Jennifer. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, uh, one of the, it, it, if we're really talking the first step, it's your LinkedIn, it's your, it's your, uh, it's your resume, it's getting, it's getting your story told properly. And, you know, if whatever you've been doing, in that time, if there's been uh, things you've coordinated or, or the like, there's a lot of information out there. Sarah's flex shops has a lot of information out there. We do. Um, so I think part of it is getting your your story straight and figuring out where the gaps are if your industry has moved since you left the workforce. If there are new skills, new technologies. Yeah, and this Kelly, I, I agree, um, and I also think you know reaching out whether through it's a flex jobs or through Working Mother or you know other organizations that are out there that are w basically fully helping, trying to help uh, women in particular get back into the workforce, um, and also if there's a way to find. Uh, working women, <laughs> working mothers, and again, I don't mean this in a, in a negative way to men, but I would hire a mother who's trying to get back into the workforce in a New York minute. I mean, I feel that uh, you will get what you give and then some over and over again, and I, I feel so passionately um, upset about sort of a bias against women who have been out of the workforce in terms of people think that they've just been home and not really respecting what they've been doing, and um, and I feel like we're, we're losing out on a, a huge number of people who can really be contributing in many different ways by making those barriers so difficult uh, for women and men, not just women, but in a lot of cases it's women to get back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. I, I would I agree with uh, both of what Jennifer and, and Kelly are saying. Absolutely, I think that at Flex Jobs we see a lot of different variations of, of people, uh, many mothers coming back to the workforce after gaps. And one of the pieces of advice that I would say is own it. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be apologetic. Yeah. And and realize that this is a decision you made. Um, and you know, for example, we had one person who had applied for a job years ago, and she had a big gap on her on her resume. And on top of that, she was kind of career switching. And um, she, I asked her about her time off, and she explained she was a mother, et cetera. Um, they'd had, and but she also told me a story that she'd had a chance to. This is fairly extreme, but it highlights. A uh, really great spirit of somebody I'd want to hire um, is that she and her husband had decided, you know, she'd lost her job and he um, hated his job. And so they decided their kids had gotten a little older, but that they'd take a six month um, trip with their children internationally. And they w did it on a very frugal basis, but they decided they were just going to take the time that they had off since um, the, the, their work wasn't uh, going the way they wanted. Um, and they made the most of this experience. And it was something very valuable that they gave to their children as a life experience. And she was telling me this, and I'm like, wow, you know, so many people come through the door and say, I've just been unemployed, you know. And not everybody can obviously do that. That was a very extreme scenario, but it was something that, you know, whether you're volunteering, whether you're doing things with your, your children's school, or um, for whatever reason you've left, own it. You've probably left for a pretty good reason, usually. Or you're, you do have time to some degree, or if, if you've been laid off, for example, and make the most of it, own it. Um, because it, coming in apologizing almost with your tail between your legs is something that absolutely is picked up on by potential employers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, and life is life. Uh, that's one of the things with work flexibility that we've found time and time again. Yes, working mothers are one of the primary audiences, but they are not the only audiences who need flexibility from some, some standpoints. And even Trina's ex experience of having to have surgery you know, many people have health scares or health problems that unexpectedly take them out of work. And just having even flexibility in those situations where people need a little understanding and, and, and have to kind of, again, own the experience. You can't apologize for that stuff. It's not in your control. Um, so that would be, yeah. That's a good point. And also kind of leads into this question from Gail. 
Gail says, I asked my company for some flexibility, but it was declined. I know, Kelly, you were saying earlier that uh, there, flexibility is really, you know, possible in any job. Um, you just you have to sort of figure out how that works. Um, so Gail is wondering, how can yeah. I change their mind? Or perhaps I can't. I'm thinking about quitting since I don't think I can handle full time. Yeah, no, that, look, that's the thing. I do believe it in my core, although you're not always going to get it. Um, you know, so my advice might be for Gail to put a pitch together. Um, you know, she made the pitch and asked for flexibility. They said no. Maybe she goes back and says, here's a little more what it will look like. Or can we try it? Can we try it for right, two pilot. months? Can we, it, right, pilot it. And if it doesn't, and then have a conversation, and if it doesn't work, um, you know, we'll, we'll accept that. So I think sometimes we probably have to do a little more on our end in terms of giving our managers and supervisors and executives um, a way to see it and, and even give them the chance. And, and truthfully, if in two months it doesn't work for the company, it doesn't work for the bottom line, it doesn't work for productivity, then we have to accept that it might not work here. And then maybe for Gail, maybe it will be that she may then need to find sort of another opportunity within her same industry or maybe considering something else, which will allow her to have that flexibility. But I hope the first step could be that she might be able to repitch it with some more spe specifics and maybe even with some sort of time frame in mind, and they may uh, give it a look. Those are great tips. Anyone else have any other tips they wanted to offer? Um, I, I would no, say I think, keep I think in mind. Great. Oh, great. Uh, I, I would say keep in mind different kinds of flexibility too. Um, a common misunderstanding mis mis is that flexibilities are one type of thing, or they have to mm -hmm. stand alone. Mm -hmm. Whereas telecommuting is one that is often thought of, but really flexible schedules, part-time schedules, alternative schedules even, um, and part-time work can all be types of flexibility that, so kind of assessing your situation, assessing your role, uh, identifying which parts are really conducive to the type of flexibility you want, and what really honestly works for you. Um, I think, for example, a lot of people glorify telecommuting or think, oh, I can work from home, that'd be so great, but really they might not be set up for it. Um, and it might not actually be great, and maybe only 40% of the role can even be telecommuting. So being honest and assessing it and, and being, you know, identifying there might be other kinds of flexibility than you might have originally thought. Yep, absolutely. We have a couple people here who are asking about um, what it's like with older children. So I know on this panel we actually have, you are all parents of, of kids of varying ages up right up through um, early high school years, or early teenage years, I should say. Um, so it, first of all, does this all go away once your kids are older? I know all the issues in the film were for younger kids and for moms just starting out. Um, so first, does it, does it go away? Is there a magic point where everything becomes much easier? Or does each stage have its own challenges? And do you have any tips for handling those challenges? <laughs> the feeling, I know. No. The, mm -hmm. will be. the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my quick answer no. is no. It doesn't, it doesn't go away at all. But I think uh, because you have time to, to get used to it and learn how to manage everything and kind of create your own your own method, then uh, it gets a little easier just mentally, you know, but I don't, yeah, with a 13-year-old, oh, no, it doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah. the I mean, my easier, life has though. been changed with a 12-year-old a who can pick my son up on her way back from school on the day when I'm running late, so now we are technically never late, so it has gotten easier in that regard, <laughs> you know, which is a, such a blessing, but uh, uh, she's just uh, once they can start texting you and overwhelming you with emojis and Snapchats, it's a whole different world. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, we, we talk about, um, all, you know, those tears we all felt, right, when we were first having our children and leaving them and being at work and whatever. And so important to be with our kids then, too, but we, as, and I'm not in the teenage years yet, but I know many people would say being around in the teenage years may be even more important than, you know, being around mm -hmm. for the nine-month-old, um, as long as that nine-month-old is being cared for well. So, so in some ways, it becomes even more of an issue where you want to make mm -hmm. sure you're around and, and just sort of listening to the conversations and, and, and picking up any red flags that might develop because, you know, bigger kids, bigger problems. So that's uh, an important issue as well. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, technology helps a lot, and so it helps you communicate with your kids and, and know what's going on and where they are, but it also makes things a lot more complicated because with technology now, your kids are communicating with the rest of the world, and so that's a, that's a whole other you know, variable um, that makes things uh, a little bit crazier. 
Yeah, my my, I, I think that there's some parts that get a little easier and other parts that get harder. And and I really am trying to focus on enjoying when it's a little easier, <laughs> like really valuing it and, and and being present for it and not taking it for granted, um, because it, it is it's going to ebb and flow. And um, I I. I'm enjoying that my kids can get themselves dressed. I'm enjoying that they can brush their teeth. They can do certain things that certainly they weren't able to do when they were little. And I personally enjoy sleeping a lot more, sleeping through the night for most nights at least. And um, but enjoying when it is a little easier because it, that's just sweet, so sweet. Oh, I love that. That's a perfect note to wrap up. I know we've reached the top of the hour, but um, this is uh, sort of the end of our discussion here. But first of all, I want to thank Vlada for creating this film, for doing all of the hard work that went into this and giving this to us to create these discussions and have them. Thank you so much, Vlada, and also for being here today oh. to participate in the discussion. Yay. Thank, thank you, Vlada. You. Thank you. Bravo. So thanks. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Getting a lot of thanks from the audience as well. And thank you to all. Thank you, Kelly Wallace, for being here. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Jennifer Owens, very much. Oh, thank you. It's so much fun. It's nice to be with my peeps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And thank you, Sarah Sutton Fell. Thank you for being here as well. My absolute pleasure. This has been an honor. Wonderful. Well, thank you all to the audience also for attending, spending this time with us today and also watching the film. Um, again, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, you'll be able to view it until midnight tonight, so be sure to check it out. Uh, tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up email with a quick survey. Please take the survey. It takes less than a minute. There's only a few questions. And it also will include the handouts from today and links to the recording. So if you wanted to review this at all or send it to any of your friends and family, uh, that will be in the email as well. So stay on the lookout for that. And then after today, the film is available on iTunes and Amazon if you want to purchase it there. Um, so thank you all so much for your time and attention. Great questions. Great discussion. And here's to having it all. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye.